Well, this is the sixth and final installment in our series over going over our purpose statement. And you all know our purpose statement, and it simply says that Parkside Church exists to glorify God by gathering people, growing together, and giving ourselves away. And we've had, uh, this will be the third message on giving ourselves away. Now, why do we need so many messages on that particular point? Because... Now, we are all, to one extent or another, reluctant to give ourselves away. Now, we struggle with that part of it sometimes. And so we've been looking at it. And this particular portion of Scripture, I've preached this uh, several times before. And it's a great piece, and there's a lot to learn. But I have to confess, I have sort of a love-hate relationship with it. I, I love the message because it's so good, but sometimes I kind of hate complying with it because it asks me to do things that I may not particularly want to do. It asks me to stretch myself in areas that I may not want to stretch myself. That's why we purposely position giving in the last position in our purpose statement. Because the first thing we have to do, we have to gather. Whether it's someone else or it's us, we have to be gathered. We have to come to know Jesus. That's a, the number one thing. We start there. And then from there, we grow. You know, we use the term baby Christians and mature Christians and all those sorts of things. And as we grow, we become mature. And the more mature we come, then the more we can give ourselves away. And, and the classic example is Christmas. You remember Christmas when you were little? What was the number one thing you liked about Christmas? Presents. Presents, because you received them. But now that you've become adult men and women, mature people, what's the number one thing you like about Christmas? <laughs> but yes, exactly. <laughs> but, but, you like giving them. <laughs> now what, is, what is more fun? To receive a present or to give one to a little child? You love giving those things to your kids and your grandkids, and it's just great. You know? So that's, the, that's what happens to us as we mature. Now, don't get me wrong. I still like getting things. In fact, I, I mentioned to Sue the, uh, the uh, 2014 Corvette. They, they, they've rebranded it now the Stingray. And by the way, check this out. You don't think we live in a fascinating age. Now, if you get the base model... Just the, the entry level model. It comes with a 455 horse V8. It'll do 0 to 60 in just under 4 seconds. 190 top end. But check this out. 30 miles to gallon on the highway. Now not at 190. Uh, but uh, So I mentioned that as a possible Christmas present. We'll, we'll see. Anyway, I, I digress. So what do we become when we become Christians? We become, if we read, read the Gospels correctly, we become servants, right? That's what it's all. Or slaves to Christ. That's one of Paul's favorite terms. So if we become servants, if we become slaves, what is our destiny? Paul tells us in Romans 8.29. We've talked about that, right? We're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And Christ was a servant of who? All. Right? So, if we want us to be servants of all, but we have to grow into that. We have to mature into that. If you look at Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28. It shall not be so among you, he says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So if we're going to be like Christ, we have to become servants, don't we? Because that's why he came. And that's, that's kind of tough for us to do. So as you listen to Jim read through our story, I'm not going to reread it for you because I, I trust you all listened. And, and some of you have read the story many times anyway. We, can, we notice that we have three distinct uh, groups in this story. We, we have Jesus. We have his followers, the disciples. And we have the crowd. Okay? Now we're going to go through here and we're going to see what we can learn from each one of these groups. Okay? And, and the first point 
is one of those things that causes me the love-hate relationship with this passage. I, I say that uh, tongue-in-cheek, of course, but I don't really like this first point. And the first point is simply this. Others' needs take precedence over ours. Now, I will tell you, I struggle with that. That's hard for me. I was the quintessential only child. It's all about me. See? But Jesus says, no, Daryl, now that you are a member of my kingdom, a citizen of my kingdom, it becomes all about others. Now, depending on your personality, you may struggle with that a lot. You may struggle with that a little. But we all struggle with it to a certain extent. So let's look and see here how this situation plays out for the crowd. You'll, you'll remember as, as Jim read in verse 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. And when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Well, what was it Jesus heard? that caused him to withdraw. Well, if you read the first half of chapter 14 there, you find that they are retelling the story of uh, John the Baptist losing his head. Okay? So when Jesus hears about that, he takes his disciples and he withdraws. In other words, they were on the run. They were on the lamb. They were, they were getting away from things. Now, do you think... Remember, these are real people in real time. The, the, these are, are actual events. Do you think that Jesus was up for ministering to a bunch of people and meeting their needs? I doubt it. I, I would guess that they were probably uh, undernourished, under uh, sleeping. Their I can't even talk. They, they were not getting enough sleep because they're on the run. They're trying to get away. They want to go out to a desolate place. Just get by themselves where they're not going to be disturbed and see what God would have them to do. And what happens? Here, all this gaggle of people hear about it too. And, and they've also heard about what Jesus has done and all these miracles. And they follow him out there. Now, I don't think it's too much of a stretch, remembering that Jesus was fully human as well as being fully God, that when he first noticed all those people, his first thought might have been, come on, Father, why do you bring them all here now? I need some time off. I need some downtime. That may have been his first thought, but it wasn't what he did. Now, many of these people... We're just there to see what they could get. And we know that. They had seen Jesus do miracles and healings and things. And so they wanted something also. And sometimes we'll read, at least if you read theological things, uh, we read where uh, sometimes Christians can be very disparaging of non-Christians who come to church or, for all the wrong reasons or do whatever it is they do for all the wrong reasons. Jesus says, that's okay. I don't care why they came, you minister to them now that they're here. So whoever comes, whatever their motives, Jesus says, meet their needs. So what does Jesus do? He focuses on their need. We look here at uh, verse 14. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Jesus focused on their needs. He had compassion on them. Now when you see someone with a need, do you have compassion on them? And then what we read next is very important. He healed their sick. So he met their need. And it seems that he did this before he addressed the crowd. It's kind of interesting. The first thing he did was meet their need. James chapter 2 talks a lot about what? Talks about faith without works is dead. See, so if all we do is talk, we're probably not going to see the results we would see if we actually did some things. Now, I, I told you about the, the two Mormon kids that came by my place the other day when I was working and volunteered to help me with their suits and ties and I'm doing uh, shovel and wheelbarrow work. 
Yeah. And they didn't say a thing about the Mormon church. They didn't say a thing about Jesus. They didn't say a thing about anything. They just engaged me in conversation and offered to help me with what I was doing. We can take a clue from that. You see, they saw a need and they offered to fill it. Now, as I said, I have my theological problems with them, so it's, I'm not about to uh, convert to Mormonism. But, we could take a hint from the way they were trying to make a bridge to get an opening to talk to me at a later date. So, we need to make sure that when someone comes to us with a legitimate need, that we meet that need as best we can. Sometimes we need to meet people's physical needs. Sometimes their emotional needs. Uh, sometimes uh, before we can minister to their spiritual needs. I know I have uh, a neighbor that has been talking to me lately. And all she talks about is the same stuff every time she talks to me. She has so many kids and she has this problem and that problem and the other problem. And I just listen. So... I don't know what's going to happen down the road, but I listen. And sometimes that's all you need to do, is just listen. So, others' needs take precedence over ours. Second point is, find a need and fill it. That, that's a quote from Robert Schuller. that's what he always said. Find a need and fill it. And that's a good, good way to look at it. Let's see what we just see now as we focus on the disciples. Too often Christians recognize needs, but wait for others or God to meet them. Okay? Find a need and fill it. Now, the, the disciples here saw the need, right? Verse 15. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. The disciples saw that the crowd needed food. And so they figured the compassionate thing to do was to let the people go away and find some way to feed themselves. Doesn't seem all that far out of context. They thought they were being compassionate. They said, okay, Jesus, cut the message short here. These folks need to go home and eat. They're, they're hungry. But what does Jesus say? This is one of those parts I don't like. I don't think the disciples liked it either. Verse 16, but Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. See, I don't like that part. And you folks don't like it either, most of the time. You see, because how often do we pray for God to do something when we have the resources to do it anyway? We pray for God to give, us, give the church money to do something, yet if everybody in the church would tithe, the church would have all the money it ever needed. We, we pray for God to uh, help our neighbor, uh, but maybe we just need to get up and go over there and help our neighbor. Uh, there, there was a great movie well it wasn't great by the standards of Hollywood it was just a simple little movie that I saw years ago and it was about this country preacher uh, in the 1800s and he was going along on his horse he's an itinerant preacher as they, a lot of them were in those days and he comes upon this family this young guy and his wife and they had a couple three little kids and they have this one horse cart and they were in the process of immigrating from one place to another and their horse had died and here they were in the middle of the road with this cart and this horse and the guy can't move it so the pastor gets off his horse and he helps the guy get the dead horse out of the way and all that and he says how can I help you guys further and they said well we need, we need another horse and we have no money and no way to get another horse and he says well I'll pray that God will bring you another horse. So he sits down right there and he starts praying that God will give these people a horse. And as he's praying, he opens his eyes. Heaven forbid, you know, you're not supposed to pray with your eyes open. I don't know where that tradition came from, but anyway. He opens his eyes and of course, what does his eyes fix on? His horse. 
And then in his mind he says, oh, no, no God, not my horse. <laughs> and he began, continues to pray for a horse and his eyes open again and there he is, he's fixated on his horse. And eventually he gives him his horse. See, we don't like that part. And I'm just being honest with you, we don't like that part. I don't like that part. I don't want to give you my horse. I want somebody else to give you their horse. <laughs> but God says to the disciples, you give them something to eat. Now, I don't think the disciples like that part either. Let's look on here in verse 17. They said to him, we have only five loaves and two fishes. Now, interesting here, the disciples had made provision for themselves. They had brought food, enough for themselves. Five loaves and two fishes. As what they're saying is, Lord, we have ours, let them go get theirs. Or they're saying, Lord, we have ours, you sent manna for the children of Israel, why not send food for these people? Do anything, but don't make us give away our fishes and our loaves. Jesus ignores their objection and simply says, bring what you have to me. Now, I struggle with this too. I struggled with this this morning. I tell you. Yes, I, it's my custom to put my tithe check in for the month, the last Sunday of each month. So we've had this project going at home. We built this dog kennel, see? Well, as is always the case with me, the dog kennel is about a little over 100% over budget. So, so I'm at my desk this morning and it's time to write my tithe check. And I think, wow, I could really use that extra money this month. Because I'm, you know, the bill's going to come due for all the supplies and stuff. And I struggle. I'll, tell, I'll be honest with you. I struggle. I finally wrote the tithe check, but I didn't like it. <laughs> but I did. We struggle, don't we? When God gives us things, and we forget everything we have He's given us. When He gives us things, once we get them, we get the squirrel complex. You know, we've stuck it away in our hole for winter and we want to leave it there. But every once in a while he says, no, pull some of it out and give it to somebody else. And that's what he's doing with his disciples here. He's saying, bring it to me and let's see what I can do with it. And he said, bring it here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. They brought what they had to him, they gave it up and he gave it back to them and says, now you give it away again. Hmm. He's always asking us to give it away again. And so they do. Here's the key. Bring what you have to God. You know, whatever you have, I know it's an old cliche, but hold it in the palm of your hand with your open. Too often we hold it like this. I've got it, it's mine, and I'm going to keep it. Oh, I'll throw a little token out now and then. Okay. No, as Christians, or as mature Christians, we should hold it with an open hand and say, Lord, thank you for filling my hand. Now take what you want. It's hard to do. But as we mature, as we become conformed to the image of Christ, we are more and more able to do that. Now, why did Jesus put them through all this? Why did he simply not rain down loaves and fishes from heaven? He could have done that quite easily, couldn't he? Sure he could. He could have had a caravan just happen to come by that day, 
with all kinds of food on it. There are a myriad of ways he could have met that need without involving the disciples. So why did he do that? He did it for the same reason that he involves you and me in his work. Because he wants us to be workers in his kingdom. He wants us to participate in the growth of the kingdom. He wants our faith to be built. He wants our hearts to be matured. And so he says to us, you give them something to eat. You bring to me what you have and watch me multiply it into what others can use. You know, Ephesians 4 and 11 and 12, Paul says that he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors for the building up of the saints for the work of service. See? Now you may say, well, I'm not an apostle, I'm not a pastor, I'm not an evangelist. But you are, aren't you? In a sense of the word. At least an evangelist, because you're all at Christ's ambassadors. So he has chosen to use you to build his kingdom. And you say, well, I don't have the resources to build his kingdom. Of course you don't. But bring what you have, offer it to God, and watch him multiply it. Now, notice the crowds part in verse 19. Then he orders the crowds to sit down and be served. You see, God doesn't ask the crowd to participate in the serving. He asks his disciples to participate in the serving. All he asks the crowd to do is sit down and receive. We need to take notice of that. Do you see the pattern? Jesus provided, the servants served, and the crowd received. We're here to meet the needs of others not to have our needs met. Now, we go on. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. That's a lot of people. Five thousand men including women and children, you can do the math. That could be fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand people. And they all ate. But here's what I want you to notice. When Jesus provides what kind of provision he makes. And they all ate, and here's the key, and were satisfied. You see, when Jesus provides something in our lives, and we embrace it, we're satisfied. And I, I think of the woman at the well, you know, in John chapter 3 where he tells her, if you knew the water I'm offering you, you would never thirst again. See, it's different when God provides something. It's one thing for us to work hard, earn some cash, go buy what we want, whatever. But it's a whole other thing when God just provides it. Or when we realize that God provided us with the ability to earn it in the first place. And then... They gave him their five fishes, or five loaves and two fishes. And when they're all finished feeding the crowd, what do they get back? Twelve. So they get twelve full baskets. So they got back in abundance more than they started with. And it's then again another cliche, but you cannot outgive God. You just simply can't do it. As you give to him, he gives back in ways that you may never imagine. So what did Jesus get out of this whole thing? The one who created all of these things for everyone else, all of the loaves, all of the fishes, the people all got fed, the people were all satisfied, the disciples who started out with five loaves and two fishes ended up with twelve full baskets. That's a full basket apiece for each of them. And what did Jesus get? Nothing. The creator of the universe went without dinner and fed everybody else and asked nothing for himself.
But here's what he created. In that moment, he created an opportunity for the disciples. Because each of them had more than he could use. And he created the opportunity for them to share back with him. But you'll notice in the narrative, it doesn't say anything about what they did. We don't know. We don't know. But we do know this. He did not ask. He simply created the opportunity. And you know, sometimes it's that way in our Christian walk. He won't tell us to do something specifically. He won't, there won't be this loud voice from heaven. You know, it'd be nice if there was. So you knew what to do. But he creates the opportunities. And he says to us, he says, as you're maturing in your Christian faith, I expect you to be able to see the opportunities and of your own volition, act upon them. Take advantage of them. And we all have opportunities in our lives. We have opportunities to meet people's needs. Sometimes that just, could be just a kind word. Sometimes it can be just listening to your neighbor go on and on about her problems. Uh, sometimes it can be meeting a financial need. It can be many, many things. And sometimes it's the opportunity to simply invite someone to come to church with you and hear about Jesus Christ. Or to tell them about Jesus Christ yourself. And I, we always come back to the same thing. Do you have to do it? Absolutely not. God calls you into his kingdom by his own volition because he loved you and decided to do that before he ever created you. But now he creates this opportunity. And he says, look what I've done. Look what I've given you. Look what I've done for you. Now what will you do for me? And you say, well, we want to serve you. And he says, well, then you have to be a servant of all. And that's tough. But as we grow, as we mature, we get better and better at it. So I would challenge you guys to uh, assume the disciples noticed that Jesus had nothing for himself and gave generously of what they had back to him. And I would challenge you to do the same with your lives. And when we talk about giving, it's easy to get stuck on money. And that's an aspect, a very important aspect. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about your entire lives. What can you give back? What opportunities has God given you? I, I'll share one with you. He's given you the opportunity to have an excuse to invite people to come to church on a specific Sunday, September 15th. What are you going to do with that opportunity? I don't know. But think about it. You never know what God might do through you. Because remember, one thing we've learned, and we're going to be talking more and more about this in the coming months, in Scripture, God uses the least likely folks to produce some pretty fantastic results. And He may just have the same thing in mind for you. But He won't force you into it. So, be about our Father's business. Be inviting people. Be sharing. Be loving. Be kind. Be compassionate, tenderhearted, forgiving. You know, the fruit of the Spirit. And it will all be well. Lord, thank you for this great story. For this great illustration of how you provide through your people for other people. And Lord, it's a great system. It requires our cooperation. And it's so wonderful in Christianity that it's all volitional. You never say that we have to do this, that, or the other thing to keep our spot. Our spot is secure. But you give us opportunities and you ask us to act upon them. So I would pray as we continue to journey down this road to Christ-likeness, to maturity, that you would give us opportunities and give us the wisdom to act upon them. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.